So thank you everyone and welcome to the 10th EC Beijing On Things To Come online seminar. Um, our On Things To Come uh, seminar series, um, we started it in September 2020 and it aims at introducing space missions, both ongoing and new space missions. And we have today for the 10th session, Dr. Johannes Benhoff of the European Space Agency, who will introduce the Bepi Colombo mission, which is a mission shared by JAXA and, and ESA. Um, if you've watched our previous On Things To Come seminars, you already know um, something about EC Beijing and this seminar seminars, but for those who are new to the to this uh, series and to EC Beijing, I would like to say a couple of sentences about our institute. So EC Beijing was established in 2013, thanks to the agreement and cooperation of the National Space Science Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and uh, uh, EC, so the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland. Since then, um, We've organized plenty, uh, several events, including workshops, forums, international teams. We have discipline scientists uh, and, and so on. And we share the same operation tools with EC, but we've also, also started last year uh, and this year actually a couple of new uh, webinar series also given the circumstances uh, uh, that don't allow us to organize in-person meetings. So last year, September 2020, we, we started this On Things To Come series. It's in English. And we started uh, this year in January a new series um, to present uh, the achievements and results of outstanding Chinese women scientists, which is called uh, uh, 1001 uh, Space Nights. So, um, but this series is in Chinese. So um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Ip, who is the Executive Director of EC Beijing and uh, whom you can see in the webcam. And thank you very much once again for being here. Last, uh, a heads up is in case your connection on Big Marker doesn't work, is not stable, you can uh, uh, stream, you can watch this session on Bilibili. I will share the link in this in this chat and we will have a Q&A uh, question and answer sessions session at the end of the talk. So once again, thank you very much and Professor Ip, thank you. Yes, Alola, thank you so much. Um, the, uh, let me first, you know, introduce uh, um, to his uh, daughter, Johannes. Uh, Frankhoff. Uh, Johannes, he was graduated from uh, University of Munster. Um, his thesis advisor uh, was a Professor Kilman Spoon, who is now the Executive Director of EC in Bern. Uh, after getting his PhD, he went to uh, San Antonio, Texas, USA, uh, to the uh, Southwest Research Institute as a postdoc working with uh, uh, this uh, very famous uh, commentary scientist, uh, Walter Hübner, Dr. Walter Hübner, and uh, otherwise, and he returned to, to Germany, and he, he worked at the Planetary Research Institute, uh, Planetary Forschung Institute, in, at the ARR, uh, Berlin, and, uh, and then he switched to, um, to ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, because his uh, specialty, his uh, research specialty is on planetary surface, uh, thermal evolution of planetary bodies, and small bodies. So now that he is uh, working as uh, his uh, very important uh, task is to work on the as a project scientist for the ESA's uh, Mercury uh, planetary orbiter. And as later on, uh, uh, Johannes would explain to you, this uh, BB Colombo mission actually is composed of two parts, one from ESA and one from JAXA Japan. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I will ask uh, Johannes, please go ahead. Okay, many thanks, uh, Professor Ip, for this uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk today about Beppe Colombo, uh, our mission to Mercury. Uh, as Professor Ip uh, mentioned, there will two, be two orbiters on this mission, and I will focus on the so-called planetary orbiter MPO, which is more dedicated uh, to the planet, while the other orbiter is more dedicated to the environment. Also, as mentioned by Professor Ip, uh, this mission is a joint mission between the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Japanese Space uh, Exploration Agency, JAXA. And together, we uh, explore Mercury. 
before I uh, went into the detail, I will give you a short outline what you can expect from my talk in the next 40 to 45 minutes. First of all, I will give you some reason why we are going to Mercury, why it's important, and then why uh, we believe that uh, Mercury is an important and interesting target. Then I will give you an overview of the science goals of Beppe Colombo, go a little bit into the detail of the instrumentation on Beppe Colombo, but here, as I mentioned before, I will mainly focus on the planetary orbiter of the Beppe Colombo mission. Then I will go a step back and tell you a few things about our technical uh, challenges to, to make this uh, mission happen. Uh, then I will uh, give you our route to Mercury, so to say, since it's not very easy to uh, send uh, two spacecraft and bring them into orbit around Mercury. Uh, it is a little bit complicated. I will focus on that. And during our mission uh, on, on route to Mercury, uh, we have to do several flybys and can do other activities during cruise. And since we already had a flyby at Earth and one at Venus, I would also like to tell you a little bit about our activities and maybe some results which we got. And at the end of my talk, I uh, tell you the next steps for Beppe Colombo and uh, some conclusions. So the first... Uh, thing is why we are going to Mercury and I bet many of you have your own reason why you think it's important uh, to, to go to Mercury. For me it's essential uh, for studying the formation history of uh, our solar system and there I think Mercury is a key because of its position. It's the planet closest to the sun, it interacts directly uh, with the sun and the solar wind and uh, since recently, we also observed uh, in the last decades many exoplanets, which also have orbits very close to its parent star. So studying Mercury may also help us to better understand uh, the exoplanets and then both all things uh, could fit together when we get a good understanding of Mercury. But in addition to that, and here I mentioned it a little bit uh, sketchy, and we, as we do it sometimes for outreach, uh, Mercury has also some mysteries. And, and that is what we not only learned from the Messenger mission, which was a NASA mission, which uh, orbited Mercury for almost four years, from 2011 to 2015. And they got a lot of surprising results, but it started earlier. It started already in the 70s when we had uh, three flybys of the NASA Mariana 10 spacecraft. They detected an Earth-like magnetic field at this planet. And at that time, it was not expected at all because Mercury is a small planet and is a small planet very close to the sun. And for a planet very close to the sun, you would assume uh, that it has cooled in, in the beginning uh, quite fast and then that there is no... Uh, liquid outer core which we would need to drive a dipole magnetic field and so that at that time was already a surprise uh, and made us to correct uh, many of our formation models which we had in mind for the evolution of mercury and uh, this magnetic field was then confirmed by messenger but as another surprise then messenger found that this magnetic field is not centered in the core like we see it on Earth. This magnetic field is shifted to the north by almost 20% of the radius of the planet, which for Mercury is roughly 400 kilometers. One other surprise result was that for a planet so close to the sun, it was uh, assumed that uh, they are not so much volatile. They are blown away by the solar wind that was uh, the theory of, of many uh, formation models. And we also expect formation temperatures which may be higher uh, than those of other terrestrial planets. But when we, or messenger measured the potassium to solarium ratio, which is an indication for the volatile content on the surface and also for the formation temperature, they got a value which is even a little bit higher as the one uh, of Mars. So instead of expecting a low value which falls on, 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 on 
a line uh, which, which you could see here, the value is even higher than uh, what we saw on uh, Mars. And that means that maybe uh, this planet is formed somewhere else and then pushed to the position where it is right now. Or we need to update our formation models and try to explain why we see lower formation temperatures and much more volatiles uh, for Mercury. The other thing uh, is that Mercury is very hot, has a very hot surface, 450 degrees is, uh, around this temperature, the maximum temperatures. And what you not expect would be water ice, but there is water ice in this planet. Because this planet is not tilted like Earth, uh, its rotation axis is uh, almost uh, perpendicular to the orbital plane. There are some craters at the North and South Pole where the sun never shines into. And uh, in these craters, uh, we found water ice. And so here we would like to understand where did this water came from, the series, asteroids and comets, and can it be stable and how much water is, is on this planet. Then another thing is uh, the uh, processes in the magnetosphere, which seem to be uh, much faster than what we see uh, on, on Earth. Uh, but also, since Mercury has no uh, atmosphere, uh, the magnetosphere, when we have a strong solar wind, is much more compressed on what we see on Earth, and that allows particles to interact with the surface. And uh, you have different kind of processes there, uh, reconnection processes. Uh, and uh, so that needs to be studied and then follow on, and maybe we can also learn uh, much for our magnetic field and our magnetosphere by looking at uh, Mercury. And last but not least, uh, there is a other feature, uh, scientists call it hollows, uh, that are bright features uh, in, on, on the, the rim of some crater floors or inside the, the craters, which are brighter and younger. And uh, if you look at, at uh, these uh, structure, it looks like it could be formed by outgassing of volatiles. And since these are young uh, structures, uh, one question is, is it possible that these structures are even active today? And there is Pepe Colombo having a mission almost a decade later than uh, Messenger. Maybe if we see some changes of, of these structure, we could confirm that even today, there are some activities going on, on on this planet, which in the beginning, when I started out, many people thought, oh, why do you want to go to Mercury? It's a boring other moon. And sorry to say, they doesn't want to say anything against the moon. Uh, but uh, people only expected craters and nothing special. But if you look at these examples, which I put out here, I think we have many, many reasons to go there and to uh, undiscover all these uh, mysteries. Then uh, we made a list of scientific objectives which we would like to uh, look at uh, for Bappi Colombo. That is the, uh, then in summary and uh, taking all that what I told you before into account, the origin and uh, evolution uh, of the planet uh, which we would like to study, Mercury's figure, the interior structure and the composition in order to understand what material is on the surface and how Mercury is formed. But of course, we also would like to study the uh, interior dynamics and the origin of the magnetic field. Uh, then the composition and dynamics of uh, Mercury's exosphere, uh, because Mercury has no atmosphere, it has only a very thin exosphere. The polar deposit uh, is, of course, a target which uh, we want to look into it. And then structural dynamics of Mercury's magnetosphere. And last but not least, since Mercury is in a very fast orbit uh, around the Sun, uh, we could test Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And so uh, Mercury is a perfect laboratory to study relativity. And also there, uh, we, we have some instruments uh, which are able uh, to do something in uh, this area. As I said, we are sending two spacecraft to Mercury. And one spacecraft is called MIO, it's a Mercury magnetospheric orbiter. And uh, this spacecraft is provided and built uh, by Japanese uh, industry and JAXA. 
It's a spinning spacecraft and more dedicated uh, to the environment uh, of the planet. Uh, it's in a polar orbit. Uh, and uh, it has a spinning period of uh, 15 orbits uh, per minute. Okay. On this spacecraft, uh, we have uh, five instruments or instrument uh, suites. Uh, uh, it's uh, a magnetometer, MGF, magnetic uh, field uh, investigation. And uh, this magnetometer is, uh, as you can see here, mounted uh, on a mast. Uh, so the spacecraft, when it is in uh, orbit, it has uh, four very long antennas and a mast where instruments or sensors are located. And uh, as I say, the uh, magnetometer to, to look at uh, the magnetic field uh, from uh, the planet, but also uh, the surrounding uh, is uh, located on the mast. Then we have a couple of sensors from the uh, Mercury Plasma and Particle Experiment, MPPE, uh, which study uh, low and high energy particles in the magnetosphere. And so they have uh, electron and ion analyzers. They look at uh, high energy particles, uh, also here ion and electrons, and the neutral analyzer and the mass spectrum. Then they have a plasma wave investigation, PWI uh, uh, instrument, to, to look uh, at also at the structure and the dynamic uh, of the magnetosphere with two sets of electric field and two sets of magnetic field sensors. Then they have a special dedicated uh, instrument uh, which is called uh, MSRC, uh, which is a mercury uh, sodium uh, spectral imager, which look at the sodium uh, content. Sodium uh, is uh, uh, an element or molecule which uh, we, we found uh, a lot uh, on, on Mercury, uh, also from ground-based observation. And so they have a dedicated uh, instrument on this, on the Japanese orbiter. And last but not least, they have a dust monitor uh, to uh, study the distribution of the interplanet du uh, dust uh, in, in the orbit. And then, and here I would like to go a little bit more into detail, uh, we have uh, our European Mercury planetary orbiter. This is a spacecraft which is always nadir looking in a polar orbit. And so we get a global coverage quite fast because the planet is then spinning underneath us. And with every orbit, and we have 10 orbits a day, an orbital period of 2.3 hours, uh, we get a global coverage uh, after almost half a year. We are in a low eccentricity orbit, 400 times 1,500 kilometers. And on this uh, orbiter, we have a very comprehensive uh, suite of instruments covering the whole wavelength spectra from the radio to the gamma ray uh, and uh, 11 instruments. And uh, one instrument is the Moore instrument. It's a Mercury orbiter radio science experiment. And this is dedicated uh, to, to radio science. It has a K-band transponder and measures in, in, in K and X band the very precisely the position of our spacecraft and uh, then the, also the uh, disturbances from the planet and from the structures of the planet to get a good uh, grip on uh, the inner structure of the planet. And uh, in order to make this uh, radio science or position even more precise, uh, we have, in addition, an accelerometer, and this accelerometer uh, will then measure the, the noise of the spacecraft. So when the sun interacts with the spacecraft and then particles hitting the spacecraft, this noise and this undulations can be measured by the ISA uh, accelerometer. Then we will correct uh, the positioning of the more by this uh, measurement. And all in all, we get a very precise uh, positioning data and uh, measurement, measurements by our uh, radio science uh, instrument. 
Then uh, moving uh, to the thermal infrared, uh, there we have a novel instrument uh, called MERTIS. Uh, it's a radiometer and thermal infrared spectrometer. And uh, this instrument is to study Mercury's mineralogical composition, but also uh, temperature maps. Uh, it has a wavelength range from uh, 7 to 14 microns uh, and uh, spectral resolution of uh, 90 nanometer. And uh, it contains of two channels, a spectral channel and a radiation channel. So uh, we hope that we will get a lot of information with this instrument on the mineralogy uh, of the surface uh, of the planet. And uh, we expect global coverage uh, with this uh, instrument after half a year. So uh, you could really uh, advance uh, our knowledge. And then uh, we have another set of imager and spectrometers, which is a suite of instrument uh, called Symbiosis. Uh, this uh, Symbiosis uh, is for uh, yeah, global coverage of the surface and high resolution imaging. We have a stereo channel, and with the stereo channel, we, we can have a pixel resolution of about uh, 50 meter per pixel. Uh, you see here the two cameras for, for the stereo uh, channel. Uh, and uh, we will get also global coverage uh, in the infrared, in the near infrared, also for the mineral composition determination uh, of the planet. Then uh, we have a high resolution camera and with this high resolution camera, we can get resolution up to uh, six meter per pixel. Uh, there we will get in our nominal mission roughly 20% of the surface covered. But if we get extended mission, we hope that we get even a larger fraction of the surface mapped at, at higher uh, resolution. And uh, last but not least, this suite uh, has uh, infrared channel uh, which is called uh, visible infrared hyper hyperspectral imager uh, VHE and uh, that uh, measures uh, in the spectral range of 400 to uh, 2000 uh, nanometers uh, with uh, a pixel resolution of uh, 500 meters. Then we, we have a laser, it's called the Beppi Colombo laser altimeter to ca characterize the topography and the surface uh, of Mercury. This is a, a, a standard laser, and also uh, there, we, uh, due to our orbit, uh, we hope uh, that we get global coverage with the laser uh, of the whole planet, uh, and spe especially in the areas uh, of the southern hemisphere, which was not so well covered uh, by the messenger mission. Uh, then we have a spectral uh, uh, spectrometer in the UV. Uh, there are also several channels in the extreme UV and the uh, from 55 to 155 nanometer in the far ultraviolet uh, of 145 to 350 nanometers, and in the near ultraviolet from 400 uh, to 422 uh, nanometers. And that is to characterize uh, the composition and dynamics of particles which are escaping uh, from the surface and are in the exosphere uh, above the planet. Uh, this instrument is mounted on our radiator side and has uh, an entrance buffer which can almost moved by 360 degrees, so can <coughs> look uh, in any uh, direction of the planet. Then in the X-ray, uh, we have uh, a very novel instrument uh, because it's not only a collimeter. This instrument uh, is also split in, in two parts. It's a, uh, it's a telescope and a collimeter, and with the telescope, we get the uh, elemental or atomic uh, composition uh, of the surface uh, in the pixels or spatial size of uh, uh, several kilometers, 10 kilometers. So we can measure uh, the uh, elemental composition of some craters. Uh, and, and that is uh, a very big advantage compared to other instruments, which has more 
uh, wider spatial resolution, but as a mix instrument, uh, we, we, we can have uh, a very uh, high uh, spatial resolution. And uh, we have another X-ray detector, which is then looking to the sun. Uh, it's called SIX. And uh, here, you, you have then uh, the comparison. You know then the source for, for the X-ray, what's coming from the sun. But there's also a particle uh, uh, detector on this instrument, uh, which looks in uh, all direction to, to see which particles we are, uh, which are coming from uh, the solar wind. Then last but not least here on, on the scale, we have uh, MGNS instrument, which is called Mercury, Gamma Ray and Newton Spectrometer. This is for the elemental composition, can also look a little bit below the surface. Uh, also, which is Newton uh, detectors, uh, very good uh, suited to look at the volatiles and the water which we expect in the polar areas. This instrument is uh, built uh, by uh, Iki from Russia, Moscow, uh, and it's a contribution to our instrument, has a great heritage. And uh, so with all these instruments, we, we cover the whole wavelength suite. And then in addition, we have a magnetometer, which is mounted on a uh, three meter long boom to be a little bit separated from the spacecraft to have a uh, noise free measurement. There are two flux gate uh, detectors uh, mounted uh, separately also to, to get a better position. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore we hope that we will get a very good uh, characterization of uh, Mercury's magnetic field. And then finally, <coughs> We have an instrument uh, on board, or an instrument suite uh, called Serena. And uh, Serena uh, consists of uh, four units, uh, which is uh, low energy neutral atoms, a sensor called Elena, which uh, looks at, as the name said, uh, at uh, neutral energetic neutrals. Uh, then we have um, particle spectrometer, neutral particle spectrometer called Strophio, uh, which is provided uh, from the US, uh, from uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, then uh, MIPA uh, instrument that looks at the precipitation of ions uh, on the surface of Mercury. And uh, this uh, instrument uh, is uh, specially dedicated. And then we have an iron uh, camera, uh, which is an all sky camera, which looks at uh, ions uh, out of the sky. And together with uh, these whole set of instruments, uh, which we have here, the 11 instrument, we hope that we get a very comprehensive coverage and that we uh, could uh, get answers to all our science questions which I put uh, there in the beginning. Here on this slide, you see uh, where these instruments are located on the spacecraft. We have uh, several instruments on the Nadia side, all our spectrometers, like the MIX instruments, the MIRTIS, uh, the camera and the laser. Uh, the uh, particle uh, or ion cameras are on the radiator side. Uh, then uh, I mentioned the magnetometer on the boom and uh, ISA on more the radio science and the MGNS is uh, inside uh, the spacecraft. But in order to get our two spacecraft uh, to Mercury, we need a third spacecraft, uh, which is called MTM, this Mercury uh, transfer module. And uh, this spacecraft carries also our propulsion uh, system. Rapid Colombo is propelled uh, by a solar electric propulsion system. And we use xenon gas uh, to, to go to Mercury. And so during cruise, uh, our two spacecraft, uh, the planetary orbiter and the MEO spacecraft, are in a so-called stacked configuration, as you see on the left, where they are mounted on top of the transfer module. And because of that the Japanese spacecraft is a spinning spacecraft, uh, it needs to be 
protected when it is stuck uh, because then uh, to avoid overheating of the spacecraft. And so we have a force structure called MOSIF, uh, which is a sun shield interface in order uh, to protect uh, the spacecraft uh, during cruise. And you see here, uh, that is then the position and where we are flying right now. This is an animation we prepared for the Venus flyby. So all the two spacecraft uh, stacked on our transfer module. On the transfer module, we have the long solar panels, which are almost uh, 40 meters spun with uh, from uh, top to, to bottom. And then the Japanese spacecraft on top. Now I would like to point out a few things to you uh, related to the technical challenges or what we had to face with uh, and to tell you a little bit about our spacecraft. You see here is the spacecraft uh, doing te vibration testing in a chamber at uh, uh, ESA and all in all, the spacecraft has a height of about 6.3 meters, so it's a really big beast. I mentioned the uh, wingspan of uh, the solar panels on the MTM, which is 21 meter on each side. Uh, then in total, the ma launch mass was uh, about uh, 4.1 uh, tons, uh, 4,100 kilograms, uh, while uh, we have a payload of roughly 125 kilograms, uh, 80 uh, uh, kilograms on uh, the MPO and 45 kilograms on the MEO spacecraft. Uh, the data uh, return we expect uh, are 1.5 terabits per year. Uh, and uh, yeah, here you see another view of the spacecraft where the Japanese spacecraft is, is not shielded uh, by uh, the sun shield. You see the magnetometer boom uh, with, with the two magnetometers. Uh, here on this side, you see the high gain antenna of our spacecraft. Here, engineers are mounting uh, the Phoebus spacecraft, which I mentioned, a uh, Phoebus instrument, which I mentioned is on the radiator side. And uh, the challenges we had uh, to, to face were that we had to yeah, react to the requirements, which were very uh, driving or very strict. We wanted to bring two spacecraft to Mercury. We wanted to achieve global coverage with Nadia pointing. And uh, we wanted to do high resolution imaging and uh, of the whole planet, which means a low orbit uh, altitude. And uh, for, for that, in order to achieve that, uh, we had to scope with uh, 10 times higher solar radiation uh, and uh, surface temperatures of the spacecraft up to 450 degrees. When you have a spacecraft, and I will show you in a minute a bit more detail, in a Nadia orbit uh, around the sun, then five of the six sides of the spacecraft uh, see always sunlight uh, and uh, mercury infrared. And then for that, you need to come up uh, with some special solutions. Also, and I mentioned it in the beginning of my talk, if you want to send uh, two spacecraft in orbit, you need a lot of energy. And uh, for us, the enabling solution to, to bring these two spacecraft there was this electric propulsion uh, uh, system and uh, many gravity exist. Uh, and then <clears throat> that is probably also a nice fact to know uh, almost 80% of our development hardware needed to be uh, adapted or special, specific invented for the BEPI Colombo mission. And that is a very high percentage. Normally it's 20% of new things, new developments, but on, on BEPI Colombo it was 80%. And that was also the reason why in the beginning we had uh, some issues uh, with uh, BEPI Colombo and uh, uh, a few uh, yeah, delays and, and that we launched a little bit uh, later than expected. Yeah, here I wanted to show you uh, the thing. So we will put our spacecraft in a polar orbit, polar orbit around Mercury. And then when the spacecraft is uh, rotating uh, 
around the sun. We have a radiator side which should always uh, look away from the sun, and that is indicated here with with uh, the little pin. So when you go around the sun, you see, of course, the radiator doesn't see the, the sun because it's in the shadow. But if you pass our closest point, the perihelion point, then uh, you're running the risk that the spacecraft uh, radiator sees the sun. And so what we need to do is to flip over our spacecraft by 180 degrees to put the radiator on the other side. And that is indicated here with a pin on the other side. And then we are flying uh, for the next 40, 40 days, uh, so-called backwards with uh, the radiator on, on the other side. And when we are then uh, back uh, to, to the next uh, point, uh, which is then uh, the uh, aphelion point, we have to do the flip over maneuver again. So in order to get not overheated and that the spacecraft doesn't get any sun on the radiator, we have to do these flip overs uh, every half orbit or that is on, on murky every 40 for days. But that's alone not enough because you get also radiation uh, from uh, the planet itself because the planet is very hot. So for the radiator side, we had to invent a special kind of fins, which on one hand, if they look to the uh, surface of Mercury, they are reflecting the heat. Uh, and uh, only uh, when we look in free space, uh, they are radiating the heat. So the uh, radiator side uh, contains fins which are tilted by uh, about 30 degrees <coughs> in order to avoid that uh, heat uh, from uh, the planet uh, uh, yeah, comes or uh, enters uh, the spacecraft. And then for uh, our blanket for the thermal insulation in order to have 44, higher 450 degree on the outside and it's cozy uh, room temperatures in the inside. We had to develop a special thermal uh, insulation, uh, uh, MLI, multi-layer insulation, which has a nextal fabric on the outside and then several uh, layers, uh, but also with some spacers in between. And, and here in my hand, you see that I have one of these uh, spacers, uh, which uh, are handmade uh, uh, for for the whole uh, MLI in order to uh, keep also a distance between the blankets uh, to, to have some room uh, to, to bring uh, the temper gradient uh, down. And so these were only a few examples of some technology uh, challenges which we had to face with Bepi Colombo in order to make this uh, mission happen. Uh, yeah, then the mission was launched. How do we go to Mercury? I think I need to go a little bit faster. Uh, so the mission was launched on uh, 20 October 2018, and we need uh, several uh, planetary flybys in order to go there. So one at Earth, two at Venus, and three at Mercury. And then uh, when we arrive at Mercury, uh, which is uh, in late December 25, we, we separate then our transfer module since it's no longer needed. And then we bring our spacecraft in an orbit. The start of the science mission is in April uh, 26. And uh, nominal mission is one year, but the design is also made that we could have uh, one additional year. Here you have the mission timeline again. And then you see that last year in 2020, we had already two flybys, the Earth ring bys and the Venus ring by. And also this year will be a busy year for Bepi Colombo since in August and October, we have our second Venus swing by and uh, in the first of October, we, we encounter Mercury uh, for, for the first time. Here I show you a few animations when we then uh, add uh, Mercury, we separate the transfer module and later we then uh, spin out uh, the Japanese spacecraft and bring it to the dedicated orbit. And finally, we separate uh, the sun shield and then bring our orbit uh, to 
uh, to the very close uh, orbit around the planet. Here, what you see on here is that after the launch, uh, uh, we uh, got a first uh, image from our selfie cameras. We put some kind of selfie cameras uh, on the spacecraft because our uh, camera system was uh, mounted on the Nadia side, and this Nadia side is looking at the transfer module, which was done on purpose because uh, with this configuration, it's protected uh, during cruise. But uh, in order to see if the deployments went well, but also to have a camera for outreach, we late in the program added three uh, selfie cameras on the spacecraft. And uh, when we saw this image, it was a great relief after launch because the spacecraft is designed for the hot environment at Mercury. But uh, uh, so uh, we were afraid after launch that it on the, our Facebook could be frozen. So we needed to fold out the solar panel quite early in order to get energy to warm up the spacecraft and keep it alive. And when we saw this image, and then we all knew that uh, the space uh, panel was properly uh, uh, unfolded, uh, it was a great relief uh, and uh, very nice uh, feeling. But also with the other camera, uh, we could do nice pictures here. You see on one camera the deployment of the magnetometer boom. Uh, which could be seen by our second camera. And then we have a third camera, which looks at the high gain antenna and controls it's uh, a little bit like there. So uh, at the end of the talk, I will uh, spend a few minutes of uh, our cool signs, uh, what we uh, could do while we are on our way to Mercury. I mentioned before that since we are in this stuck configuration on the uh, MPO side, the remote sensing instrument like Bela, Symbiosis, Mix, and Mertes are looking at the transfer module and can unfortunately not operate it uh, during the cruise. Uh, we found a solution for Mertes because Mertes has a space view for calibration and they could reprogram it that they can do observation through the space view. So we can use Mertes during cruise, but unfortunately, Symbiosis, Bela, and Mix are blocked. And uh, on the same thing for the Japanese instruments, since we could not, of course, uh, unfold the antennas and booms, but also uh, the instrument are inside uh, the MOSIF structure. Uh, during most of the time, only electrons can uh, enter into uh, the structure. But nevertheless, we, we were able to also operate uh, the dust monitor and parts of the particle uh, MPP instrument and the PWI instrument and the magnetometer. We had our Earth flyby on the 10th of April uh, with the closest approach of uh, 12,700 kilometers roughly. And also here you see some images from our selfie camera. We had a three-day campaign from the 9th to the 11th April to do some of the science. And then we had here some nice images approaching the Earth and then uh, closest approach and then a far well uh, images there. And uh, we could operate some of the instruments. And here I show you results, for example, from the ISA instrument. Uh, ISA, as I uh, told you before, measured uh, the noise uh, which comes from the particles uh, from the solar pressure on, on the spacecraft. And since we had an eclipse during the flyby, uh, ISA could uh, really see that when, when uh, we were sh uh, shielded by Earth, uh, then the pressure went down. And then so from there, we could estimate the solar radiation pressure on the order of one to the power of 10 to the minus seven meters per second square with our ISA instrument. Then here uh, you see uh, our path around Earth. We, we crossed uh, uh, some areas of the magnetic field. So the ball shock uh, when we have the solar wind uh, entering the magnetic field. And then we have the magnetic sheet and the magnetic pause. And that could be seen uh, by our iron camera and magnetometer quite nicely. What we even saw is that we have a double uh, Bowshock crossing uh, because when we went from the solar wind uh, after the Bowshock, uh, we, we see an increase of ions, but then uh, we, we got a similar uh, reading uh, for the solar wind again, and then only 
uh, we entering the magneto sheath, and here you see very clear boundary at the magneto pores, and you also see it uh, in the signals uh, from the magnetometer. And also here is uh, enlargement where we have the magneto pores crossing. You see the increase uh, on all uh, magnetic. Uh, uh, components uh, in a X, Y, and Z, uh, and uh, we had a really clearly distinction of these boundaries. Then we had the first Venus flyby in October, and uh, our first Venus flyby was from the sun side to the dark side, uh, so the sun is from the left, and as a distance of 10,722 kilometers. Our second flyby, which of course this year will be much closer, <clears throat> and also here we could see some boundary crossings uh, uh, into the uh, ionopaths. We have a special working group uh, dedicated to Venus flyby science observations, where we also define some topics that we could look into with our instrument, which is a composition, and then the interaction uh, between the Sun and, and Venus, and uh, also doing some studies at Venus and an exoplanet. Here you see the instruments which could be operated in bold on, bold, uh, on both spacecraft. And uh, again, we had a, a campaign uh, with some imaging uh, phases, but also we had some coordinated observation with uh, the Japanese Venus climate, climate, Venus climate orbiter Akasuki, which is in orbit at the same time. And we did some coordinated uh, observations from Earth. Here you see a result from our selfie camera from uh, Venus closest approach. Unfortunately, the cameras are not as good that they could provide higher resolution images of Venus. Here's some results from our Japanese colleagues, which you again clearly can identify uh, the crossings of the Bioshock, the Yonopaus. And then you see some ions which uh, are inside uh, the ion sphere uh, uh, by a Venus, which we could clearly detect uh, with our instrument. Then from the MERTIS uh, thermal uh, infrared spectrometer, we could also clearly detect here, you have a cut uh, at one wavelength, and you see uh, this higher signal is uh, Venus, and then now there analyzing the spectra and we hope that we get uh, uh, some information on uh, the chemical composition and, and the cloud layers around Venus. At the time when we had the flyby, there was a big phosphine discussion uh, and unfortunately with Papi Colombo, we are not as sensitive enough uh, to contribute to that. So there are no phosphine measurements so far from Papi Colombo. Then we had a Venus flyaway, a far away campaign together with uh, ground stations and uh, other spacecraft and their uh, data are analyzed and will be looked into. Then uh, one word on data policy, uh, we try to make our data as soon as possible uh, public and so for our uh, camera image there normally will be made public after 10 days. And uh, you see when we had the Venus flyby data release, we saw a very steep increase uh, on our planetary science archive. During the nominal mission, uh, we will make the data public after uh, six months of propriety uh, period. Next steps uh, for this year, we, we will have the two flybys. I mentioned that and uh, first solar conjunction. Uh, you see here on the left side, uh, there's a distance to the sun. So we are getting closer to the sun. In 2021, we will uh, reach uh, uh, at the end of the year already all, our almost closest point, uh, which is uh, point, uh, 0.3 AU. Uh, on the other hand, at the moment, uh, we, we are about here. And that is the distance to Earth. So at the moment, we have a quite big distance uh, to, to the Earth from the spacecraft. And that means that we have uh, currently very low data rate uh, for doing uh, cruise science. Here's an image where Bepi Colombo is today. And, and you will see we are flying in this direction. So and quite soon, we are uh, the, uh, behind the sun. And that is the time when we have our first solar conjunction. And, and then uh, we will 
uh, operate uh, our radio science instruments and then try to measure the curvature of uh, yeah the the beams to Earth. In conclusion, uh, Bepi Colombo is going to send two spacecraft to Mercury for a very comprehensive investigation of the planet and in its environment. I think uh, with this uh, set and if everything is working as planned, we will increase our knowledge uh, and maybe shed some light uh, into the mysteries uh, of this planet and provide better clues for the understanding of formation. We will follow on on messenger results. Uh, uh, good news is also that Bepi Colombo is performing as expected and we have a very enthusiastic science team and an outstanding cooperation uh, between our Japanese and European scientists. And the last uh, slide here, Bepi Colombo and messenger are complementary and we repeat some measurements almost a decade later. We uh, make new observations since we have new instruments. We have the second spacecraft and uh, all in uh, all, uh, I think it's a logical step to have Bepi Colombo now after we had messenger and that's very fortunate for all the scientists around the world. And with this word, I thank you very much and uh, sorry for talking a bit longer and uh, I'm open to answer your question. Thank you very much. Well, perfect, uh, Johannes. Uh, thank you so much for the for this very clear and, and comprehensive uh, presentation. The, um, let me see, I hope that there will be some questions. Um, the... Yeah, there are some uh, incoming questions. The first one being, how long will the two Baby Colombo spacecraft operate at Mercury? So our design, because Mercury is a very harsh environment, and so we gave our uh, engineers a requirement that we want the two orbiters to stay in orbit for a minimum of two years. Uh, when you, we do not do any active orbit control, so we have the risk that uh, at the end, the Japanese spacecraft after three and a half or four years may crash onto the surface. For our spacecraft, it's a little bit different uh, because it goes down closer to the surface uh, with its uh, closest point uh, with a periapsis. But after passing the south pole, uh, because we are also drifting to the south, uh, we will go up again. And so in principle, we can stay there for quite a while, but maybe after a few years, uh, our thermal system is maybe not as good as uh, it was before. So at least two years, but I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. But you have enough fuel, right? I mean, the fuel, how, how about the fuel? Uh, the fuel should be enough. We have uh, some margins, but uh, we, we need to do these flip over maneuvers uh, once in a while and then wheel of losing because we have this three axis stabilized spacecraft. And, and so it could be at one point that we are also running out of fuel. Mm -hmm. But uh, since that will happen very likely after the two years, we have not really looked into it uh, so far that uh, there is no definitive end of the mission at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if, if you have no fuel, you could still you still could do do measurements, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. We we don't need uh, the fuel for for any orbit adaptations and and so. Uh, but of course, uh, when, when you cannot stabilize the spacecraft anymore, uh, then of, we, we may have also have a problem. Can you read those uh, questions on the, on the chat box? Uh, you could pick yeah. them. Yeah. There are four more questions. There, there are one more than uh, four. from Mary, Mary, Mary Parkinson. Uh, can you read them? Dr. Mori Parkinson says the spacecraft enter Mercury orbit during a solar maximum period. Is there a risk that a solar energetic particle event could reduce the lifetime of the payloads? Uh, yes and no. You, you can see it in, in both ways. Of course, for some of the instruments who are depending on an active sun, like our mix instrument, they love to be that the sun is more active because then they get a stronger signal and we will get a better elemental uh, composition. We have taken this risk into account in the design of our instruments. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so I, I think, of, of course, if the sun is very active, there's always a risk. But uh, I think the risk is uh, handled. We can handle that risk. Okay. There is also a question from Professor Blanc. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the general relativity experiment? How do you take advantage of being at Mercury for that? Which GR effect is studied? Oh, I must say I am not an expert on, on this uh, experiment, uh, but uh, we, we found out that we can uh, increase the precision of some of the relatively parameters like gamma and beta by a factor of 10 uh, uh, with uh, our setup uh, with uh, the accelerometer in conversation with a more uh, experiment uh, and also uh, uh, we, when we now do uh, the solar conjunction, uh, we need to have a disturbance-free uh, uh, time on our spacecraft. So if we can manage to avoid wheel of loading during the 14 days uh, of the solar conjunction period, uh, we uh, hope that we uh, improve compared to the Cassini experiment, which was uh, done at that time by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. There's a question about mm -hmm. why why the Japanese space club is spinning and uh, the you, you, uh, the user of it uh, is is not. Uh, okay, for for when you look at the environment and you want to monitor what's going on in the environment, you would like to have the uh, 360 degree field of view. And so if you have a spinning spacecraft, you, you can look in all the direction. And it also has some advantages uh, for the thermal control of the spacecraft. Uh, on our side, uh, we wanted to do have a global coverage and uh, we want to make measurements from the surface. And uh, for example, with the high resolution camera, look at craters and also with the laser. And for, for that reason, it's much better to have a three axis stabilized spacecraft because uh, then uh, you, you get much higher res resolution on the images uh, and uh, it's uh, yeah, much better to, to do these uh, remote sensing uh, uh, tasks. There is another question. Would it be possible to detect changes in Mercury's magnetic field by comparing the Bepi Colombo measurements and messenger observations? Sure, that, that for sure. But uh, especially on, on the magnetic field, we hope that uh, together with our two spacecraft and then to having two magnetometers at different points, so to say, in the Mercury environment, one magnetometer close to the planet and one magnetometer on the Japanese orbit uh, inside or outside the magnetosphere. We think that uh, it will help us to separate between parts which are coming from the planets uh, and or originated from the deep hole field or uh, parts which are introduced or induced uh, by uh, the solar wind and the solar magnetic field. So of course, we will look also at the uh, messenger data and uh, we will benefit from it. But especially here, we think that we also have a good system with the two spacecraft and the two magnetometers on both sides. Thank you. There is another question uh, regarding any planned joint observations of Bepi Colombo and the Solar Orbiter mission of the European Space Agency. Uh, we have a working group for that, so we, we um, have uh, a group of, of uh, young scientists uh, uh, which looked into it and uh, they found a lot of opportunities where it makes sense uh, to have combined operations between Solar Orbiter and uh, Bepi Colombo. And so we identified some spots and some uh, time uh, frames uh, where we would do that and then we have already done that. Uh, there are something in the pipeline uh, for the upcoming half a year, but especially also on our second Venus flyby, Solar Orbiter will be uh, there two days earlier, uh, has also a Venus flyby than Bepi Colombo. So both spacecraft in uh, August are very close to Venus. And uh, so we, we can use uh, uh, 
after the flyby solar orbiter as an uh, upstream monitor for our uh, data analyzers and then uh, 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 then later as a downstream monitor so the, we are doing something together and we're looking into that and then there are some nice opportunities where we can benefit from each other very good Thank you. Uh, do we have further I questions from the audience uh, it seems we do not um to the to the audience if you have any further question time is almost up so feel free to um to type it in the chat box i don't know if you if you professor Ip, have any other questions for dr Bankhoff. but johannes you 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 told us that you have want to show us something your model or something oh, oh yeah that that was here was one of the spaces we we have in in uh, the mli because we don't want that the layers touch each other uh, touch each other and so when we have our next layer on top and then then uh, titanium foil layers we needed some spaces and then uh, this is uh, one of the uh, spaces uh, which uh, were, were developed and then uh, you saw it on, on my image of the mli that uh, uh, you saw this uh, thing here which was seen outside uh, to um, yeah stabilize this thing and in the beginning when when we had uh, designed our mission uh, we had also done a little bit of uh, sewing this uh, uh, layers together. But then uh, when we did a thermal test, we found that these uh, lines where you had the sewing of uh, putting this uh, layers together was a thermal heat leak into the spacecraft. So uh, at the end, we needed to make sure that we have uh, around the spacecraft a constant distancing of these different layers of the MLI. And for that reason, we invented these spaces. Uh, and uh, in the test, they performed very well. And we hope that it will also work at Mercury. OK, thank you very much, uh, Johannes, for this uh, very nice, uh, important introduction. And um, maybe, Laura, you could, you could remind our audience that there will be uh, three other uh, BB Colombo related uh, uh, talks uh, in, in the coming, yeah. coming weeks. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Bankhoff. This is indeed the first one of four. So we're going to have three more uh, seminars about the Bepi Colombo mission. The upcoming one will be on March the 10th with Professor Gabriele Cremonese. Uh, and it will be especially about symbiosis, uh, still the Bepi Colombo mi mission about symbiosis. And the following ones will be held by Professor Yoshifumi uh, Saito and Professor Murakami. In one of the questions, um, there was also the solar orbiter mission of the European Space Agency. Agency. It was mentioned in, in the questions, and we will also have um, several seminars about the Solar Orbiter mission, the first one in April with uh, Daniel Müller. So thank you very much once again to Dr. Bankhoff. We will publish the recording of this uh, uh, webinar tomorrow or the day after, and feel free to drop us a line in case you have any feedback uh, uh, about uh, the On Things To Come series. Thank you very much and see you on the 10th of March. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much.